You needn't think I've slipped the tether, Elliot, or grown cracked in the head like some addled fool. There's men out there with stranger habits, madder quirks than my own. Why, I recall Oliver's grandfather, a man dead set against the motor car, refusing to let any infernal machine carry him faster than his own two legs could run. And if I'm to despise the subway with its dark, unwholesome caverns, that's my own business and none other. You'd do well to know we arrived here in half the time by taxi, spared the hill climb from Park Street, had we gone by the blasted train. Now you say I'm more high-strung than last you saw me, more twitch and start to me. Well, maybe I am. The year's been no gentle one, and God himself knows it's a marvel I've held my sanity. But you're here, prying, like I'm on trial, picking at my nerves. You never used to be so inquisitive, Elliot. What's got you so hot on answers? And it I see you're resolved, so I'll give you what you're after. Perhaps I ought to, since you've pestered me these long months over my absences, wringing your hands because I cut the art club and gave Pickman a wide berth. I can see you've drawn your own conclusions about Pickman's vanishing act, but you've missed the mark, for I've not the faintest inkling where he went, nor the will to ponder it. Best the police hunt it down, though I doubt they'll find him, or his other haunt, that place in the North End he kept in secret, going by the name Peters. I reckon I could scarcely find it myself and wouldn't try, even at midday. Oh, I know full well what that place held and why he kept it, but I'll not be sharing such things with the law. They'd expect me to guide them back, but I couldn't return even if my own life depended on it. No, I won't walk those cellars again, and you may find some humor in that too. No subway, no descent into the cold earth, and laugh as you will. But there's sense to it. You ought to know that I didn't abandon Pickman for the piddling reasons of Reed or Minot or Bosworth, those twitchy souls who recoil from shadows they don't understand. Pickman's work, however morbid, didn't unsettle me. No, I found it magnificent. His mastery over scenes of nightmare a wonder to behold. Boston never saw a hand like his, never will again. I said as much when he painted ghoul feeding, and I hold to it still. You'll remember that piece. Minot saw it and turned away in disgust. You've got to understand the man was something beyond. A true artist, no dabbling hack. He knew fear like a butcher knows his cuts, dissecting terror itself, laying bare its anatomy, its sinew and bone, every twitch of nerve. Only a master understands that delicate art, that deep-seated instinct for strangeness, which a brush can rouse in a man's blood. Any fool can paint a monster, but Pickman made the very air quake with dread. He reached a place far beyond Dore, or Syme, beyond even the night-haunted Fuseli. His was a terrible art, raw and keen, and I hope to God there never breathes another with such power in him. What he saw, what gave him that vision, I can't know. But I can tell you there's a difference between art that recalls nature and that which goes beyond to drag forth visions that fester and crawl from some haunted place we were never meant to see. Pickman's was an eye that looked upon scenes from beyond life, not merely imagined but remembered in some primeval way, dredged up from the spectral depths where his soul roamed. His art spoke with the voice of that deep place, and God helped the man who strays too close for it was not born of mortal understanding, and no living thing should walk the shadows where he trod. Don't press me to tell you what he saw, what visions lay behind those painted horrors. For it is one thing to take what nature offers, the small and breathing things a man can see and understand, 
and quite another to plumb depths that even darkness shuns. The ordinary artist deals in imitations, mere renderings of life as it lies above ground, known and secure. But those few, the ones cursed with that dark gift, they go further, deeper. They summon from some murky place what no sane man would think to summon. And they paint not what the eye beholds, but what the soul recoils from. And Pickman, God help him, was such a one. His art stands apart from that of the pretenders, the cartoonists who churn out some feeble attempt at nightmare, all flash and spectacle, empty as a conjurer's trick. No, Pickman could conjure something different, something alive. A glance at his work, and you felt not the chill of fancy, but the cold, iron grasp of truth itself. If I had seen what he saw, if I'd stood in the shadows where he stood, I'd not be here, not as you see me now. His was a vision beyond life, beyond the pitiful borders of mere imagination. And he carried that vision in him like a smoldering coal, burning into everything he touched. You'll remember his gift with faces. I dare say there's been none like him since Goya a man with the uncanny skill to draw hell's own madness onto a human visage, to twist a mouth or a gaze until it breathed with the charnel stench of the pit. And those that came before Goya, the men who set their gnarled visions into stone at Notre Dame, Mont Saint-Michel, those medieval minds who wrought chimeras to guard cathedrals and seething demons to mock the saints. They too must have seen what he saw, or things like it. Pickman once told me he traced his art back to those men, and the way he said it, I wondered if perhaps he truly had walked among them in some unnameable way. It was that laugh of his, I think, that drove old Reed off. Pickman had a way of laughing, sharp and low, a laugh like a blade running over stone. Reed said the sound clung to him, wrapped around him like smoke, that it grew with the weeks, as if he were changing subtly by degrees. And indeed, Reed would rant on how Pickman's face itself was shifting, twisting into something other than human, something like the creatures he so keenly drew. Reed fancied himself a student of pathology, full of talk on evolutionary throwbacks and the degenerative pathways of man. He'd say Pickman was devolving, that he had an unnatural look to him, like he was something ancient, struggling against the trappings of this present world. But what Reed couldn't fathom, what none of them could, was the sheer breadth of Pickman's genius the raw power with which he tore into the unknown and dragged out its vile shapes, burned into his canvas for any poor fool to see. For my part, I only grew more fascinated. I knew what a marvel he was, how deep and dark his gift, and I came to his place often, listening to his wild speculations, following his flights into strange realms of thought. It was a sort of worship I felt, a devotion to something beyond understanding, for I knew what we had in Pickman was rare. That painting, Ghoul Feeding, was proof enough. The club wouldn't display it, nor would the museum touch it, and no soul would buy it. But it was a masterpiece, Elliot, and I told him as much. I held firm, even as his other friends turned away, and it wasn't long before he began to confide in me, to draw me in as his confidant. One night he spoke of a studio in the North End, an old house half-fallen, a place hidden away from the living streets, where he said he could work without restraint, without the prying eyes of those weak souls on Newbury Street. There are things, he told me, that the polite world will not suffer, things that must be left to the shadows. Back Bay isn't Boston. It's a pretty plaything, new and bright, 
clean as a showroom floor. And it doesn't know the ghosts of the past. But I need the old souls, the phantoms with some memory in their bones, ghosts with a real history. I need something with dirt under its fingernails, with blood and bone and the weight of old curses. That was Pickman's art, tapping into those spirits that linger, feeding on the city itself, a place where the brick walls hold memories that shudder through time. He knew that to touch the soul's dark overtones, you had to call forth the ghosts that still roam, the shades that have looked upon hell and held its secrets. He found them there, in that crumbling house, and he painted by their light the wild shadows dancing on his canvases, whispering the dark secrets of old Salem's witch trials, of the gallows and the curse. Pickman held to those shades like an unholy thing, dragging forth what most men could not bear to look upon. And I, Elliot, I followed him, mesmerized by his forbidden art, stepping closer to that abyss with every hour. I saw it, saw the way he painted, and I knew then why his art was greater than anything we had seen before or ever will see again. There are places man is not meant to go, yet Pickman ventured into them and brought back visions of the damned. The North End is the only place fit for a man who paints from the marrow, the sinew, a place not so much built as it is worn into the earth, a place where the very stones are worn smooth by the souls who've trod them for centuries. Any man who calls himself an artist and holds to his purpose ought to live in such quarters, among walls that have borne witness to the whole procession of life, birth, death, and the awful spaces between. You must understand, man, that parts of this city date back to days when the world still had teeth. There was a mill on Copps Hill before there were ten proper homes in Boston, and they laid the streets there in the days when men lived with the devil in their midst. This city has stones that have endured long past their mortal use, yet still they cling to their old intentions, just as they did in the dark ages when witches roamed among us, when pirates prowled the waters and dragged their hidden treasures ashore, burying their dead among ours. Do you know, they hanged my ancestor on Gallows Hill, with that pious vulture Cotton Mather nodding in approval. They tied her fast and strung her up, but I'll wager she knew things, strange things that no living soul should ever know. Mather, may he rot, was terrified of her, terrified that her witch blood might slip free of the earthly cage they'd thrown it in. If it had been up to him, he'd have staked her to the ground and burned her into dust, lest some unholy remnant should escape into the night. I know places he feared, houses he wouldn't dare set foot in, though he railed about righteousness to his flocks. These houses stand still, and though they appear crumbling, lost to time, they hold firm in the shadows of this city. You know that the North End once held tunnels linking the houses, the graves, and the sea itself, don't you? Those old places with their crooked halls and ancient cellars, they crisscross underfoot, a map of the dark, keeping their secrets sealed off from the common air above. These tunnels, they carried whispers, voices, things not meant to see the light, and if you know where to look, I could show you houses still standing where you'd find oddities in the cellars. Wells walled up and leading to nothing. Hidden arches and pits like holes chewed in the flesh of the earth itself. To think of modern man's faint heart. A man of my calling, trying to do his work, is branded a fiend if his brush dares to scratch at the deeper truths. 
they'd sooner blot it all out, block it from the mind, so that even at the art club, where you'd expect them to crave more than cheap Sunday amusements, they shudder at the hint of something real. They're terrified of facing what I could show them, of visions that might tear back the veil between this world and the darker one beneath it. The only mercy of this modern time is that it lacks the spirit to press too deeply into the past. Maps and records, they tell us nothing. They obscure, bury the real history, blind us to the alleys, the deep-laid paths that wind through the forgotten corners of this city. The North End is brimming with secrets, dreams, horrors that go unseen. And there are none left, save perhaps myself, to comprehend them, much less put them to use. Listen, Thurber, you've an interest in these matters, that much I know. Suppose I told you I've another studio in the North End, a place where the soul itself can resonate with the dread of the past. There I can paint as I truly must. You know, I've long believed that one must paint terror as well as beauty directly from life. And so I went exploring to find the living fear in the dark spaces of this city. I've learned that Boston's ghosts are stronger than its living men, that they have the power to seep into the flesh, to crawl beneath the skin. And I mean to paint their world, to reach further into the ancient dark than any before me has dared. I've got a place, Pickman said, that maybe three other Nordic souls besides myself have set eyes on, and I'll wager those three did so under duress or by accident. As the crow flies, it's a short distance from the elevated, but as the soul moves, it's centuries away. I took it on account of the old well sunk deep in the cellar, built in a time before this city had its name, back when men weren't afraid to reach below the soil. The house itself is a ruin, sagging into the very earth, and no one else would dream of renting it. I'd be ashamed to tell you what I pay, a pittance, really, but the state of it suits me well enough, and I work best in darkness anyhow. The windows are boarded, the whole place looks fit to be swallowed by some yawning black pit, and for what I do, that's best. I keep a couple rooms above, furnished in a sparse way, but it's down in the cellar where the inspiration is thick as fog, where I pull my brush strokes from the shadows themselves. The man who owns it, a Sicilian, has no notion of what I do there, and I hired the place under a different name. Peters, I told him. It's better that way. Better that no one knows who rents the place, or why. If you're up for it, I'll, I'll take you there tonight. Let you see what I've been working on. I think you'll find it... educational. It's no grand tour, mind you. Hardly worth the cab fare, so I usually go on foot, keep suspicion down. We can take the shuttle from South Station to Battery Street. After that, it's not far. Well, I hardly had time to refuse, and his insistence gnawed at me. So there was little I could do but steady myself as he hailed a cab. We took the elevated from South Station, disembarking at Battery Street, a bit past midnight. The air off the waterfront was rank with salt and a coldness that seemed to drift up from beneath the earth, more than from the sea, if such a thing's possible. We walked past Constitution Wharf, and I lost track of the streets as we went deeper into the maze, winding our way through alleys that grew narrower and darker with each turn. Finally, we came to a foul-smelling lane, the oldest, most crumbling alley I'd ever set foot in. The gables jutted overhead like the crooked teeth of a corpse, and the small paned windows glinted in the pale moonlight broken and pocked with grime. I'll swear to you, Elliot, that some of those houses dated back to Cotton Mather's time. 
two of them even had an overhang, the kind you scarcely see anymore. Once I thought I caught sight of a roof line, a sharp peak like those old pre-gambrel types the antiquarians claim don't exist in Boston anymore. We took another turn, then another, left, right, left again, all into alleys that seemed more like passages in some ancient tomb than anything that had ever borne the light of day. Pickman produced a flashlight at last, and by its faint, sickly glow, I saw before us a door that looked as if it might crumble to dust at the slightest touch. It was ten-paneled and had a worm-eaten look, ancient beyond anything I've known. He unlocked it and I followed him inside. The hallway was bare but for the panels of dark, ancient oak, rough and cracked, every inch of it alive with the lingering scent of old wood and decay. I could almost hear it sighing, as though it carried the weight of every passing year, as though it remembered things long dead. Pickman led me to a room on the left, lit an oil lamp, and motioned for me to step in. Now, Elliot, I pride myself on being of firm constitution, a man hardened to the ways of the world. But I'll admit to you that what I saw there turned my stomach. You see, those were the paintings Pickman never showed on Newberry Street. The ones that made all his other works look like Sunday illustrations by comparison. God, how he let himself go with these. I felt a need for a drink, and another after that, if I'm being honest. There's no sense in my trying to describe what hung on those walls, for words couldn't capture the visceral horror, the foulness that clung to every image. He had stripped the scenes down to some basic, gut-wrenching truth, and there was nothing of the otherworldly you'd find in Syme's strange landscapes or Clark Ashton Smith's phantasmal fungi. No, these were far darker. Old churchyards, looming cliffs, brick-walled vaults, and tangled woods that seemed almost to bleed shadows. I recognized Cop's hill burying ground in a few, the place not five blocks from where we stood. And he captured it not in daylight, but in the midnight hours, when it was alive with the shifting forms of things that haunted his imagination, and mine as well, I fear. But the horrors lay not in these scenes, grim though they were. No, it was the creatures he conjured into being within them. There were monstrous forms, humanoid, but hunched and degraded, with faces that spoke of things no man should know. Their flesh was sickly, rubbery, their eyes sunken and glistening with the hunger of carrion beasts. In one painting, they crouched in a graveyard, their jaws slack and dripping as they fought over what lay sprawled between them. Something that seemed too wretched, too lost, to be called human. It was the faces, Elliot, that did it. The eyes that leered, the mouths twisted into lecherous smiles. All of it so infused with life, I felt they might claw free of their frames at any moment. And he painted as if hell itself were his model, as if he had looked upon some realm where creatures like these roamed free. The way he captured their expressions, I swear, it was as though he had painted from life, as though these things had posed for him in the dank corners of that cellar, with only the oil lamp to light them. He had let his brush become some ungodly instrument, and in those paintings I saw a horror far beyond the bounds of mortal experience, a horror that lived and breathed in the shadows of that room, pressing against the walls, clamoring for release. As I looked at those works, Elliot, I understood at last what Pickman had become, or perhaps what he had always been. There are secrets in this world, things no man should unearth, and he had pulled them up from the deepest shadows, from the very marrow of darkness. And standing there with the reek of ancient rot around me, 
I felt as though I'd stumbled into some pit of damnation, as though I was glimpsing the abyss through a hole in the world itself. The madness and the horror lay in those figures, Elliot, in the way he gave them the appearance of something close to human, yet so far from it that the sight made my skin crawl. Pickman's art, if you could call it art, was one of infernal portraiture, demoniac to the core. These figures he painted were seldom wholly human. Most of them were crouched and half bipedal, their bodies bent forward in a manner that made them look more like beasts than men. They had a rubbery sheen to them, a kind of loathsome texture that made me feel as if they might slip right off the canvas and spill across the floor, all glistening with the residue of some hideous birth. God help me, but I can still see them clear as day, though I'd give anything to scrape those images from my memory. Their occupations, well, let's not dwell on that. I wouldn't wish such knowledge on any man. They were always feeding those wretched creatures, gorging themselves with a wild abandon on things I don't care to name. Pickman showed them grouped in churchyards, in tunneled catacombs, in the shadows of half-buried crypts, sometimes locked in a terrible combat over their spoils. And the way he painted the bodies they feasted on, Elliot, the hollow sockets of those eyeless faces, the slack jaws, the twisted forms. I believe he made them not simply corpses, but something charnel, something like a warning from the grave. I swear they looked as though they knew of their own ruin and were leering back at me, mocking the life that looked upon them. There was a scene of them leaping in through an open window in the dead of night, some clambering over each other, while others squatted atop the chests of their poor victims, clawing at their throats, staring down with those pale, soulless eyes. And one canvas, this one nearly undid me. It showed a pack of them, baying and clawing around the hanged form of a witch on Gallows Hill, their warped faces bearing an awful kinship to hers, as though the doyai. Say we're relatives greeting a long-lost ancestor returned from the grave. But I'll tell you, Elliot, the settings were almost nothing. The real horror, the true abomination, lay in the faces. He gave those faces life, a cursed life, as if they watched you from the canvas with eyes that tracked your every movement. They leered, they slavered, they grinned with a malevolence so keen it felt like the edge of a knife drawn across the skin. By God, man, I tell you, those creatures were alive. Pickman, that twisted sorcerer of an artist, had somehow captured their very souls in paint, and in each stroke he'd summoned hell onto the canvas. His brush was no mere tool, but a wand for spawning nightmares, a conduit for the horrors that lurk at the edge of our reality. Then there was one called The Lesson. I tell you, Elliot, it shook me to the core. There in a mossy, sunken graveyard squatted a ring of dog-like monstrosities, teaching a small child to feed as they fed, showing it how to gnash and tear with an unnatural ferocity. Pickman hinted at the price of a changeling, you know, the old tales about how these otherworldly things swap their young for human children. And there it was on the canvas. A human babe transformed, taught to devour, corrupted by their vile tutelage. He was illustrating what becomes of those stolen away into darkness, showing them raised into creatures more akin to vermin than human beings. I realized then that he was hinting at something far more disturbing, that these creatures weren't merely born that way. No, 
They were twisted into such forms over years, the human aspect draining from them bit by bit. My eyes drifted to another piece, this one in a Puritan home, all heavy beams and lattice windows, a family gathered around a Bible. Each face bore a look of reverence, except for one, a young man whose countenance seemed all but sneering, mocking the scene around him. The rest of the family was pure, noble even, but this one face, it had a cast that reeked of the pit, and Pickman, with a supreme irony, had painted it in his own likeness. A changeling, I thought, a thing that looked human but was kin to the creatures he painted, creatures he perhaps called family in some strange, sick way. Pickman, the devil himself, turned up a lamp in an adjoining room then, and with a gentlemanly flair, as if he were guiding me through a gallery of flowers and meadows, he asked if I might care to see his modern studies. Elliot, I was barely holding myself together, yet something compelled me to follow him into that next room. I'd steeled myself, braced my soul against the damnable visions that had turned New England into a tapestry of hell. But there, in that room, I saw something that no man could be prepared for, something that tore away the comforting veil between the horrors of the past and the creeping dread of the present. This second room thrust that horror into our very own world, Elliot. I saw scenes I recognized, streets I had walked, places I knew, but now teeming with these hellish forms, these creatures unleashed in our midst. He had painted Subway. Accident. A scene of vile things writhing up through a crack in the Boylston Street subway, dragging themselves into the very heart of Boston, attacking the helpless on the platform. Another showed a dance on Copse Hill burying ground, the tombs silhouetted against the moon as the creatures leapt and cavorted, filling the air with silent screams. I saw cellar views, too, dark spaces with creatures crouched, waiting behind barrels or lurking near furnaces, poised to lunge at the first soul to descend those creaking steps. One canvas more hideous than the rest, showed Beacon Hill as if it were cut in half, a cross-section exposing layer upon layer of monsters pressing upward from their tunnels, writhing in grotesque, ant-like swarms. There was another of a vault, and there the creatures gathered, one of them clutching a Boston guidebook, reading aloud as the others pointed and leered, each face twisted with a laughter that seemed to echo through the very bones of that cursed room. The faces, Elliot. I cannot describe how they contorted with glee, how they laughed with a mirth that mocked the living. I understood then why his art held such power. Pickman's creatures weren't born of fantasy or even madness, but of a vision so precise, so keen, that it penetrated the veil itself. His brush moved not in delirium, but with the cold, scientific hand of a man who paints not what he dreams, but what he has seen. He had stared into a realm of horrors beyond life, and he painted it with the sober precision of a man chronicling fact. He led me back to the cellar then, to his studio proper, where the damp and dark pressed close and the air felt alive with something foul, ancient. And I saw then, I knew, that his was no ordinary vision, that he had tapped into the pulse of something buried deep beneath Boston. A darkness that crawled through the veins of the city like a pestilence, something that had lurked there long before the first stones of the city were laid. And I, Elliot, I had walked into that darkness. I'd looked into that chasm where no light reaches, and in Pickman's studio, I saw the things that gnash and writhe beyond the edge of this world. By God, I saw them, and I'll never be free of what he showed me that night.
Gad, how the man could paint. I'll say that if he had not been driven by some dark compulsion, he might have turned his talents to gentler, even noble pursuits. But no, that twisted genius of his bent forever toward the grotesque, the morbid. There was a piece called Subway Accident, and it showed these vile things, clawed and hunched, swarming up from some hidden catacomb through a crack in the floor of the Boylston Street subway. You could see them rushing out into the dim light, their teeth bared, their limbs tensed, throwing themselves upon a crowd of helpless people on the platform. The panic was etched into their expressions, faces twisted with the horror of a moment's realization, as if they'd looked into the abyss itself and saw it staring back, alive with terrible hunger. Another painting took me to Copps Hill, but not the cemetery you'd recognize. No, this scene showed the modern graveyard teeming with the revenant forms of the long dead, twisting and cavorting as if in some ghastly, unholy waltz. Shadows passing over the tombstones, a festival of the damned in full swing. And still another displayed cellar views, a vision of monsters creeping in from the edges of the canvas, slipping through crumbling mortar and broken stone, lurking behind barrels and furnaces, their eyes aglow with the malevolent patience of predators awaiting the first poor fool to venture down the stairs. But it was one particular canvas that stirred a revulsion in me so profound it turned my stomach. Pickman had sliced open Beacon Hill as if it were a hive of insects, each layer teeming with those vile creatures, hunched and insectile, squirming through burrows, honeycombed through the very bedrock of the city. They pressed upward, crawling toward the surface, and I could almost feel the claustrophobic press of them, breathing their mephitic breath, rank and hot, rising from the hellish depths. And there were others yet, one more macabre than the last, a vault scene where dozens of these things clustered around some figure clutching a Boston guidebook. They pointed, each face twisted and epileptic, mocking laughter, the sound of which I could almost hear echoing through the dank room. The picture's title, Holmes, Lowell, and Longfellow Lie Buried in Mount Auburn, chilled me more than the figures themselves, as though Pickman wanted to remind us that death is no sanctified retreat, but merely a gateway to horrors lurking in the dark earth below. I stood there, breath coming shallow, my grip on sanity hanging by a thread, Yet as I forced myself to look closer, I began to understand what set Pickman's work apart from other grotesque art I had seen. There was an unspeakable callousness, a disdain for all that was human, woven into each frame. It was not simply that the things he painted repelled with their inhumanity. No, it was that Pickman took such perverse delight in showing humanity debased, dragged to its knees, reduced to nothing more than fodder for the unspeakable creatures in his hellish imagination. The creatures thrived in their cruelty, and Pickman's art captured this essence with an almost surgical precision. He painted with the skill of a master surgeon, peeling back the flesh to reveal the beating heart of terror beneath, a thing alive and pulsing with malevolent life. His vision was sharp, crystal clear, his hand merciless. These weren't the misty, unreal shapes conjured in nightmares, but rather cold, exact renderings of a world Pickman saw with clarity, as if he peered through a window to some stable realm of permanent, mechanistic evil. At that moment he led me down into the cellar, his true studio, and I braced myself for the madness that awaited below. The staircase descended into damp darkness, and as we reached the bottom, 
He flicked on a flashlight, pointing it toward a corner of the floor. There, as if waiting to swallow us whole, was the circular brick lip of a great well. Five feet across, with ancient brick walls a foot thick, it rose six inches from the ground, sturdy and weathered, remnants of some forgotten past. He told me it was one of the ancient wells that had been part of an underground network stretching beneath the hill, linking houses, tunnels, and catacombs in a morbid lattice of stone. I could tell it hadn't been bricked up, and a round, heavy disk of wood sat atop it, the only barrier between us and whatever lay below. A chill gripped me, and I looked away, the implication of that ancient opening weighing on me like a curse. We passed into the next room, a cramped space with a creaking wooden floor, furnished with canvases, a table cluttered with brushes and paints, and an acetylene gas lamp that filled the place with a ghastly glow. He called this his studio, and here he worked by night, using photos to capture scenes he might paint later, drawing from a darkness so deep it felt as though I'd never see the sun again. This was no ordinary studio, but a place where visions of hell were born, where he brought to life the things that clawed at his mind from the shadows. As I looked upon the unfinished canvases, the horror grew more vivid, and I understood why he needed this darkness, why no daylight could ever touch the works he produced here. For what Pickman painted in that cellar was not of this world. His images cut through the fragile fabric of human sanity and scraped the marrow of one's soul, leaving it raw, exposed, trembling in a silence thick with the knowledge of things better left unseen. In the end, I think of that place as an entrance, a portal to a madness deeper than any nightmare. And I realize that Pickman hadn't merely painted these horrors. He had unlocked them, invited them in, and allowed them to infest his soul. As I left that dark den, I knew one thing with a terrible certainty. The world he showed me was no invention. It existed as real and solid as the bricks beneath our feet, a world of darkness, crawling just beneath the thin veneer of our own, biding its time, waiting to swallow us whole. The unfinished pictures leaning against the walls, their twisted forms half-glimpsed in shadow, held as much malignancy as the completed horrors upstairs. But here they seemed somehow more raw, more intimate. There was an exactitude to his process, the scenes carefully blocked and marked with penciled lines that gave away the meticulous labor Pickman invested in each hideous detail. You could see the marks where he had measured, adjusted, obsessively chased down his lines, and I realized that he worked with the focus of a surgeon. Even now, after everything I saw, I'll admit it. Pickman was great, Elliot, damnably great. I saw a large camera on the table, and he explained its purpose, how he used it to photograph the settings for his works. He'd snap these scenes as reference, he said, for a painter needs to revisit his subject over and over again to capture its every hidden angle. I'll tell you now, knowing what I do, that camera chills me more than any photograph he might have taken with it. The sketches, ghastly, half-finished creatures, leered from every side of the room, as though each paper held something with a nascent life of its own. And then Pickman moved toward a massive canvas, one covered in a filthy cloth, and he pulled it away with a flourish. What lay beneath was enough to drag a scream from me, a sound I could barely choke off as it clawed out from my throat. The echo of it rattled back from the walls, catching in the corners of that old nitrous cellar, and it took all my strength to clamp my jaw shut and stifle the laughter that clawed at my chest. 
God above, I could barely grasp what was real anymore. This, Elliot, this was something that twisted the very laws of nature, as if it had no place in this world. I can't believe that the earth could harbor such a thing, even in the deepest abyss. The thing on that canvas, that monstrosity crouched with bony claws, gripping what was once a man, gnawing at its head with a viciousness you'd see in a child gnawing on a scrap of meat. It hunched low, the tension in its form suggesting it might at any moment spring for something still living. The face, Elliot, bore a warped and bestial snout, pointed ears that twitched forward and eyes that blazed like a beast's, bloodshot and vile. Its limbs ended in scaly claws, half-hoofed, like some twisted relic from a blackened myth. But none of this was the heart of the terror. No. What rattled my soul was the very technique, the way Pickman had breathed life, life, into that canvas with the accursed mastery of his brush. He'd given the creature not just shape, but essence, an animation that seemed to pulse and twitch in the stillness. That monster lived, Elliot. It was there in the room with us, and I knew then, without a shadow of doubt, that Pickman had seen this creature not just in his mind, but in some darkened, hellish reality. There's no other way a man could paint such a thing but by standing before it, by looking into its eyes, feeling its breath hot upon his skin, as if he'd summoned it from some subterranean chasm, and let it crouch there, waiting. His brush had become an instrument of damnation, pulling such things from the depths to torment those foolish enough to look upon them. Pinned to the canvas, curling up at the edge, was a piece of paper, small and yellowed with age. I leaned forward, thinking it to be a photograph, probably a scene he intended to paint into the background of this nightmare. I reached for it, and at the same instant, Pickman jerked upright, his eyes fixed on some point beyond me. He'd been listening ever since my scream had shattered the silence. And now he stiffened with a terror that gripped him physically, like a hand clamped to his shoulder. With one swift motion, he drew a revolver, put a finger to his lips, and slipped out into the dark cellar, pulling the door closed behind him. For a moment I was paralyzed, half expecting some awful creature to scuttle into view. I forced myself to breathe, to listen. Somewhere in the dark I heard it, a faint scratching sound, like claws scraping stone, followed by a series of muffled squeals and bleats that made my skin crawl. Huge rats, I thought, though they sounded like no rats I'd ever heard. Then there came a strange clatter, the noise of something heavy and wooden colliding with brick. Wood on brick. It sent a chill through me, and I realized it reminded me of something, something that gnawed at my mind but lay just beyond the edge of recollection. The sound grew louder, as if whatever it was had broken through, fallen deeper into the dark. A sharp grating followed, the unmistakable sound of wood splintering, then a frantic scuffling. I heard Pickman shout, though I couldn't make out the words, and then the revolver fired. Six shots in quick succession, each report deafening in that confined space. There was a strangled squeal, a heavy thud, more scraping and clattering, then silence. When the door opened, Pickman's face was pale, his revolver still smoking in his hand. He muttered something about the rats, about how they'd gotten too bold, claimed they'd gnawed through from some adjoining passage. And I almost laughed, but I knew better than to question him. Those were no rats. Whatever he'd seen in the shadows of that old well, it had stirred up something ancient, 
something that should have remained buried. And in that moment, standing there, I understood with a clarity I'd never had before. This was the world Pickman lived in, a world where nightmares crawled up from the depths to walk among the living, where death and darkness joined hands beneath the earth. And God help me, but I had seen it too. It came again louder, a vibration rolling up through the floor like the throbbing pulse of something vast, some buried heart. It sounded as if the wood had fallen into a depth far deeper than mere basement stone, as if it had descended through layers untouched by light or air. And then the grating began, a sickening rasp of wood against brick, the kind of sound that makes your teeth itch. Pickman, madman that he was, shouted something wild and unintelligible, a curse or perhaps a chant. And then I heard the revolver, all six shots, fired one after another, the reports crashing like thunder in that silent house. There was a squeal then, or maybe a bleat, like nothing I'd ever heard from rat or beast, a sound that twisted something deep in my chest, left me gasping. A dull thud followed, then silence, thick as oil. Before I heard the scraping again, as if stone were grinding against stone somewhere far below. When he reappeared, his face was all light and laughter, as if nothing unusual had passed, the revolver still warm in his hand, and he cursed the rats in that way of his, half-joking and yet entirely serious. "'You've no idea what these tunnels are like, Thurber,' he said, grinning. "'God knows what they eat.' though I imagine they've had their fill of graveyard roots and salted sea carrion over the years. But whatever it is, they must have run out, for the West Deep... I say we're damnably keen to crawl out tonight, and I suppose your yell didn't help matters. Woke them up, perhaps. He laughed, and there was a feverish light in his eyes, like a man possessed. I think they add something to the atmosphere, don't you? A fine, unexpected effect, like salt in a wound. And with that, Elliot, he led me from that cursed cellar back up the stairs and through the maze of alleys that twisted through the north end. We emerged onto Charter Street, I think, but I was so disoriented I could hardly say where we were. The buildings swayed in the darkness, and I felt as if I'd been walking through some fever dream my mind clinging to the familiar only by threads. The hour was late, too late for the elevated, and we walked back through Hanover, through the winding streets. I barely remember it, only that the gas lights seemed faint, distant, and I felt a kind of chill creeping up from below as if something dark and damp had wrapped itself around me. When we reached Beacon Street, he left me, waving as if we'd spent a pleasant evening and promising to be in touch. I turned toward Joy Street and never saw him again. You're wondering, aren't you, why I dropped him? Why I turned my back on the man I once admired, even defended? Well, I've given it thought, and it wasn't what I saw in that cellar, though, by God, I saw enough to haunt a man's dreams for a thousand lifetimes. No, it was something I found the next morning, something I'd stuffed into my coat pocket in that last terrible moment before he'd stormed out of the room, gun in hand. The thing pinned to the canvas, a small curled piece of paper I'd absent-mindedly taken, thinking it just another photograph. I nearly laughed as I remembered it, thinking it some ghastly postcard, perhaps, that he'd meant to work into the background. But when I unfolded it, I saw that I was holding something far worse. The paper showed not a scene, but a creature, and the kbitnanleic horror he'd been painting, the one crouched over its vile feast. It was a photograph, yes, but not of a background, not of some gnarled, sunken landscape. No, this was the figure itself. 
captured in exquisite, loathsome detail. The thing caught turned to face the lens, its eyes blazing with a terrible life. Mm. Elliot, there was no mistaking it. Pigman had photographed his subject and it here before you. The hideous beast on that canvas was to figment, do fever dream. Elia, a living thing, a thing summoned from God knows where to roll into our wool, to gnaw at the edges of our sanity. Yes. That's why I left him, Elliot, and why I never looked back. He wasn't strictly human. Reed had been right all along. Whether he'd been born in some ghastly shadow or learned the forbidden rites of some ancient sect, it no longer mattered. The man had opened a door, let something through, and he'd kept it there in the dark for God knows what purposes. Now he's gone, and wherever he's gone, I hope he's met his equal. But as for me, I've done all I can to erase that night to burn away the memory of that thing I found in my pocket. No, don't ask me to describe it further, and don't ask me what I did with it. It's enough to know that such things walk among us, that the thin skin of our world holds back the horrors only barely, and that men like Pickman have found ways to pierce it, to pluck those things from the dark and make them flesh. I've tried to forget, but his paintings linger. The faces he gave those beings. Faces that seemed all too real. Now I understand why. He didn't imagine them. He knew them. He lived with them. And for a brief, unspeakable night, so did I. <laughs>